I feel particularly privileged to speak because uh, the theme for this year's UAS talks directly to my doctoral research, which as any researcher would know, you are always looking for a chance to talk about your research. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, good coincidence in that sense. Um, I'm going to basically try and um, focus on sort of bringing out certain critical issues that pertain to questions of urban commons. Um, it was also like looking at this from the right to the city perspective, but I'm also going to try and situate this a little bit um, against what we might know about um, narratives or contestations around the fisheries in other locations as well. So what is so distinctive about, say, the fisheries in a location like Mumbai, which is where uh, my research was based? Uh, what are the specific um, implications of this being located in the urban? What are the pressures that the urban therefore puts? both on the commons as well as livelihoods uh, that are dependent on them. Um, let me just begin by sort of um, putting out certain caveats on what it is that we sort of try and look at when we're looking at the commons or how are we trying to understand what the commons are. Um, now, typically when we are uh, looking at something like the common, a very common assumption that we make about it is that by describing something as being a common resource, we automatically make the assumption that these are open access resources equally open to anyone who wishes to partake of them. Um, this is something that repeatedly literature on the commons has had to sort of clarify and, and make sure to say that just because we understand something as a commons doesn't automatically translate in, uh, into being open access for everyone. So we're always looking at some kind of um, restricted access to commons that takes place. Uh, but typically those restricted accesses are built either around questions of knowledge that you might need in order to uh, enter the or partake of the commons uh, or technological sort of barriers that might be put in place, um, all of which operate in varying kind of degrees in determining the kind of access that we're looking at. Right? Uh, so that's sort of one thing to keep in mind and that very much operates in the case of the fisheries as well and I'll uh, clarify how that does um, as I jump into it a little bit more. Um, the other thing is to look at, um, again, when we're looking at communities and we're looking at common, uh, you know, communities that have livelihoods that are dependent on commons, um, you know, there used to be this sort of assumption again earlier that there were, these were undifferentiated sort of homogenous communities that were partaking of the commons, right? So an important part of the work that is done under political ecology, for instance, tries to clarify and make evident the kind of relations uh, that exist within communities itself that are dependent on common resources, the kind of hierarchies that might be in place, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, issues of, of gender, uh, caste, for instance, that might automatically put in place, again, another set of barriers in terms of accessing the commons or not accessing the commons. So we don't want to begin by assuming that um, you know, when we're talking, particularly in my research, I'm trying to look at the implications of a capitalist trans transformation uh, that is initiated both by the colonial state as well as the independent Indian state with the idea of modernizing the fisheries, for instance. We don't want to make the assumption that when we're contesting the state's idea of what it means to modernize the fisheries, that what existed earlier was pristine, pure, you know, um, completely... Um, sac you know, uh, sacrosanct or that was already inbuilt around equitable relations, nothing of the sort, right? Because there were hierarchies in place, there were gender questions that were emerging, there were class questions that were emerging. But what is happening now is that the nature of these relationships have changed, the manner in which movements are picking up ecological questions and the way they negotiate these hierarchies make a big difference in determining now who can have access, who can't. Uh, and particularly, again, because, uh, you know, this is the case of the fisheries in Mumbai, by extension, what happens is that there is a bleeding in of the discourse or the politics that is taking place around the questions of the common and access to it, which bleeds into the discourse of who can actually live in the city and who has rights over the city. Right, so that's uh, one other caveat. And the last caveat that uh, before which I start is to just, uh, again, compare this with the kind of work that is done on... Um, fisheries, if you look at, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but if you look at the Indian sort of literature around this question, um, there's been two incredible works that have come out. One was in 1991, Kalpana Ram's work on the Mukwar community. 
and followed by this in another 18 years later in 2009 you have uh, Ajanta Subramaniam's work which is also on the Mukwars itself right. So we have actually a, a whole lot of studies that take place and there are several other studies as well but typically we find uh, a lot of studies that take place on fishing communities in southern India right. Uh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala are sort of overrepresented in this kind of uh, study um, and while these works are very rich and very informative uh, and deep in their analysis uh, they of course uh, the the urban question doesn't emerge very sharply um, and the other important sort of point that they bring up which doesn't necessarily hold resonance for an urban coastal common uh, is a question which they pitch which is about the discrepancy or the relationship of coastal space to interior agrarian spaces right uh, typically when we're looking at something like coastal commons we're including the seas we're including the coastal land itself um, and within Subramaniam and uh, Kalpana Ram's work we notice that there is a the entire ma uh, manner in which the coastal common is situated and understood takes place vis-a-vis -vis the interior agrarian regions of those states uh, where the coastal commons are sort of seen as inferior in some kind of ways with the agrarian sort of interior as being placed higher in the hierarchy. Uh, this also maps over caste questions for instance. So you know which are the castes that occupy the interior agrarian regions, which are the castes that occupy the coast etc. And therefore the uh, manner in which contestations around coastal common lands take place say in Tamil Nadu and uh, or the regions of Tamil Nadu and Kerala that they look at are very different right. One thing that's very that's almost immediately stands out in the case of Bombay and now I'll, I'll just sort of jump into what, what it is that um, you know I observe, what it is that my analysis is built around. Um, so the first thing that one notices in Bombay is that um, you know Bombay is of course a tiny island that was um, you know it's seven islands that were sort of built together uh, you know they re reclaimed land between them and it's now one uh, small island and land is very critical as a resource here right. In Bombay, you, there is no sort of uh, inferiority of the coastal land per se compared to the in agrarian interior. If anything, it is quite the reverse, right? So there is a very, very high valuation of land, particularly in Bombay. And because so much of it is coastal land and because you have these old traditional Koli communities. So this is an, um, a community that traces its origin to, you know, Bombay, the islands of Bombay. They... Uh, they claim to be autochthonous uh, and there are several records testifying to their very early presence. So we don't know whether in fact they are indigenous or not, but they do have a very marked old presence in the city. Um, incidentally, this is also a community that is now trying to uh, organize uh, and get itself recognized as a tribal community and not as a, a backward caste as they currently listed. Uh, which also will feature in understanding, you know, this politics around the commons. Um, and the Koli community, by virtue of occupying so much of this prime coastal land, right, faces extreme pressures of urban gentrification, right. So this, because land is at a premium, uh, the lands which they occupy are, you know, constantly sort of being looked at as sites of further accumulation that can be, uh, generated right so um, starting from high-rise buildings that you would want to locate apartment complexes that can declare that they have a sea view for instance uh, to resorts to in fact now our new notions of what are public spaces so promenades right uh, if any of you are again familiar with uh, Mumbai uh, the kinds of promenades that you have in say Bandra, Bandstand, Carter Road those kind of spaces they are all built by taking or, or sort of carving into the spaces of traditional Koli villages, right? Uh, and increasingly in these sort of grand, fantastic urban visions that are created of what Bombay will look like, um, you know, in the early 2000s, there was this entire chant of uh, Mumbai will become like Shanghai, right? Uh, in a lot of that, there is no space or no scope imagined for these kind of uh, what we may call traditional livelihoods to continue. Uh, and the commons in terms of the spaces, the land spaces that were available were all sort of uh, again imagined for private consumption and, and accumulation. So there is this one sort of pressure that the Kohli's have al always been faced with and it keeps taking, uh, you know, it, it observe, takes new manifestations, new forms repeatedly. Um, in the last two decades or so, the politics around slum rehabilitation has been quite a critical issue in Mumbai. 
and again uh, Koliwadas find themselves in the center of this so in 2012 the sign Koliwada uh, was declared as a slum and therefore marked for slum improvement and redevelopment um, the Kolis contested this by saying that you know the um, the agreement was not sort of signed by coercion force so on and so forth but the main point was that in the redevelopment that is imagined of this Koliwada which is now within our urban discourse being marked out as a slum, there is no space to actually rehabilitate these livelihoods, right? So what is going to happen um, to that space that was occupied by fisher people who would use spaces in a variety of ways, right? Uh, to say mend your nets, to, uh, to actually drying fish, to having small open spaces where you could dry fish, uh, to keeping your boats, so on and so forth. And none of this finds any place within this new kind of urban imagination that exists. So on the question of land, these contestations have been there and by no means is this new, right? So again, if you, if one is to look at the archives, you can find a whole, um, it's a little troubling how familiar the narrative of, you know, 1902, 1912, 1914 is to what we hear in 2002, 2012, 2014, right? So after the, uh, the big plague in, uh, that happened in Bombay uh, in, under the colonial state, you had an improvement trust that was set up by the Bombay presidency. Um, and under the same kind of ideas of modernizing, improving, not having unsanitary living conditions like how slums are today marked out, the same kind of discourse was used to again uh, take over Koliwadas and redevelop those uh, sites of uh, space. Right? So this, this discourse and this kind of pressure on the commons has been a part of the Kohli history of being in Mumbai, right? But what, cha what has changed very significantly over the last four to five decades has been the strong sort of influence or, or the strong sort of initiative by the state to transform the livelihood itself, right? So from being a traditional livelihood that is practiced by this fishing community, um, there was an increased effort and this effort began again in the um, early 20th century under the colonial state but they sort of gave up that plan by mid 20th century but it's picked up again in the 1960s by the Indian state where they seek to try and transform what is a traditional livelihood into a modern capitalized industry right which can generate large sources of revenue. Revenue is one part of the story. Uh, the other part of the story was that um, this was also a time when India was striving to get self-sufficiency in food production and so fish was con conceived as something that could be a valuable source of protein and so the idea was that this would be a, you know, it would allow us to get two wins at one go which was that you would secure a large revenue stream for the state but you would also ensure a steady supply of protein for your population. This is incidentally exactly the two aims um, stated by the colonial state as well when they began uh, their project of modernizing the fisheries in the early 20th century. Uh, it was also coming at the heels of the Bengal famine. So the idea was that you needed to have additional sources of protein that was being generated in different parts of the, uh, the colonial uh, state and that could be secured in a certain kind of manner. So this was kind of the reason why the Indian state decides to transform the fisheries. Right? Uh, until then, how was fishing being practiced? So the Kohli's, as I mentioned, are these uh, this old community. It's a caste, by the way, that is also as in it's one sub caste is called the Son Kohli's who live in Mumbai. Uh, there you also have the Madhyo Kohli's, for instance, who are agriculturalists who live in the interior sort of region. But fishing, as associated with the Kohli, is a very strong part of that uh, the culture of Bombay, the history of Bombay. Uh, you know, Bollywood has. Uh, shown this to us repeatedly every time you need to have a you know a representative shot of of traditional Mumbaikars you will find a Kohli person uh, who is represented there right um, and because of the fact that as I mentioned earlier uh, you have certain knowledge and certain kind of technology that acts as automatic barriers to who can partake of the commons or not right you had only Kohli's who were practicing fishing. So one part of it has to do with the fact that this was a caste based occupation. So it was specifically understood as an occupation of the Son Kohli caste, but also the fact that fishing was something that, you know, not everyone could just, you know, get into a boat and take off into the sea. Uh, you needed to know uh, what kind of nets to use. You needed to know where you should go to fish, right? You needed to know how to navigate 
by looking at the stars for instance and this was all part of the customary knowledge of that community that is passed down from generation to generation right uh, and that ensured that in some ways the practice of fishing remained tied to the Kohli's themselves. Uh, what this capitalist transformation does though is that it significantly alters the manner in which we can think about the skills or these sort of barriers that that maintained uh, the fact that co only Kohli's were participating in fishing. Right? So come the 1960s, what happened in the 1960s was something that we call the pink revolution. Right? Um, along the coast of Kerala incidentally, they began to discover that there were extremely large um, you know, uh, resources of, of shrimps, of prawns uh, that were available. Now it's not that the discovery of prawns or shrimps was new, everybody used to, you know, one caught prawns and shrimps even earlier. But there was a very low valuation for this in domestic markets, right? Uh, people never really ate it very much. Very often, actually, prawns and shrimp were used as fertilizers, right? So you would dry it and use it at the base of trees, for instance, uh, in and around. But the 60s, what happened was that they discovered that there was a very large export market for prawns, right? So they began to realize that there was this huge market that was available in the US, in Europe for, um, you know, prawns and shrimp that are caught, processed and immediately packaged and sent off, right? And this is something that one state, uh, one coastal state after another began to uh, capitalize on. Um, the the, Indi the uh, sort of central government of India also at that point began to push this in idea to say that, look, if this is such a large sort of, uh, source of revenue, I think it constitutes today uh, more than about 1.7% of their GDP. So it's a fairly large source of revenue. Uh, why not actually push this agenda a little further and what they began to do is through various state governments begin to provide subsidies, provide funding to initiate what we call capital intensive technology into the fisheries. So earlier you would have small uh, wooden boats that would go out not very far into the sea uh, to fish and come back and uh, just another clarification there was never any idea of subsistence production uh, in this commons, right? Uh, again, that's an idea that we sometimes work with that there's always some kind of sust uh, susti uh, sort of subsistence and sustainable mix of both kind of taking place, but typically we assume this is subsistence. Uh, in the fisheries, you can't have subsistence production, right? You can't live off fish alone. You are always going to fish a little bit more so that there is a domestic market within which you can enter, trade, so on and so forth. So the idea was let's just expand this capacity more, right? And for that, new kinds of technology had to be brought in. So replace your wooden boats with large, what we call trawlers. Uh, trawlers are boats that come to us from, uh, I think, the Second World War, if I'm not mistaken, right? We used to literally sort of trawl the bed of the sea, okay, for uh, mines. And that, that same technology is now employed where you just put these trawl nets, as we call them. Um, and earlier you had in what we call artisanal fishing or traditional fishing, you had fishing that was suited to certain kinds of environment within which fishing was taking place. So if you were fishing near the shore, you would use a certain kind of net because you wanted to catch a certain kind of fish. If you wanted another kind of fish, you, caught, you used another kind of net. But now what they did was they just had these much larger sort of nets that were introduced through this new technology, uh, which could actually bring up extremely large volumes of catch, right? So very, very quickly we began to see through the state's push uh, of this kind of technology a rapid transformation in um, the volume of fish that was being caught, all of which was being exported. Um, in, they, also tried, uh, they also tried to do something very, very interesting, which is that they tried to shift the model within the fishery. So earlier when you had, again, this commons uh, and how they operated in traditional fishing, you had a notion of individual ownership, right? So one person used to own the boat and the implements on that boat. Everybody else participated uh, on the boat as labor uh, alongside the owner. So we had this particular category called the owner worker who operated within traditional fishing. Uh, so the owner is participating along with labor and therefore at the end of it, the catch that uh, or the revenue that comes from the catch is divided in an equal part for everybody who has participated in the process with an extra share set aside for the owner for having contributed it, right? Um, what 
began under the colonial state's initiation and then was carried on again by the Indian state was that they tried to transform this model of individual ownership and replace it with cooperatives, right? Uh, they be believed that cooperatives would be a more efficient way in which mechanization or capital intensive technology could be introduced. And so one of the requirements, for instance, of claiming a subsidy from the colonial state had to be, and again subsequently from the Indian state, had to be that you establish a cooperative and seven people coming together could now access this capital intensive technology. Um, through this technology, through the new kinds of boats that were brought in, there was also a transformation of the kind of knowledge or skills that you needed to now participate in fishing. So as I mentioned earlier, you, you know, earlier it was based completely on customary knowledge that one needed, right? But now with the new kinds of boats that you have, you have to compulsorily have a GPS system. They have sonars uh, to find where uh, fish are. Um, they, uh, they're, you know, uh, they have mechanized ways of the net being lowered into the water as well as being grazed, right? So essentially what we've seen is a form of both de-skilling and reskilling that has taken place with regards to fishing. And what that meant was that you no longer needed people who, were on, who only had customary knowledge of fishing who could now participate in the labor of fishing, right? So for instance, during my research, I met a whole range of young men from uh, Uttar Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Orissa, again, again, other coastal districts of Maharashtra, Ratnagiri, Sindhudurg, etc., all of whom are migrating to uh, Mumbai to work as labor on these boats, right? I met, uh, for instance, a whole range of these men from Uttar Pradesh who come from landlocked villages and landlocked, landlocked districts. They've never been on a boat in their lives, right? Uh, but they migrate to Mumbai as, you know, this circulation of footloose labor, as Jan Bremen calls it, and they've, uh, they chance upon the work uh, that is there within the fisheries. And for the first time in their lives, they go out to sea, right? And they can do this because there is no initial set of knowledge that is required for them. So they are working as, you know, labor in the sense that they have to uh, take out the fish from the nets, and this is work that is taught to them on the spot, right? So what this capitalist transformation did was it made this one very, very big change, which was that it opened up the fisheries in a way uh, and it opened up this commons in a way that had not been seen before, right? You suddenly had a whole range of people coming in to participate in the labor of fishing uh, while otherwise it was restricted to the coalies alone, right? Now, this is with regards to fishing itself and uh, fishing if you, if again you are not familiar with this, is uh, follows a very strict sex-based sex division of labor, right? And this takes place, it's not just specific to Mumbai, it takes place uh, in all states where you have men who go out to fish, uh, but women who don't participate in the labor of fishing, but actually work with what we call the retail or vending of fish, right? Um, so once the, you know, the, the fish is brought back to the shore from the auction point onwards, it is women who take over, women from these traditional communities who take over and are then participating uh, in the selling of fish and the vending of fish, so on and so forth. Now, once this capitalist transformation has happened, as I mentioned, the labor within the fisheries or within the active work of fishing opens up to absorb a whole range of migrant workers. Uh, but also with regard to fish vending, we find that a lot of the surplus labor that is uh, uh, that is present in the city, very often again migrant labor that is present in the city, begins to also start entering this again what was traditionally defined as coli work, coli women's work of fish vending, right? And not only do you have uh, migrants entering it, you also have migrant men entering it. So it's it's also perceived as sort of a, uh, you know, a disruption on two counts, one that non colies are participating, but also that something that was considered as women's work alone is now being opened up and um, you have migrant men taking to this kind of work, right? There were a whole range of disruptions that also take place here in the sense that um, coli women had a particular pattern in which fish vending operates. You buy fish from the auctions that are held either at the shore or certain large markets that have been uh, designated and then they would travel back to their locations co close to their kolivadas or close to their natal kolivadas where 
they would have market spaces that would very often be actually inherited in some kind of ways from their mothers, from their grandmothers, so on and so forth, right? Or mother-in-laws in some cases. So you had a, uh, a reserved place within a market, uh, within old bazaars, uh, for instance, that would be earmarked for you to sell your fish, right? But once you find that um, this transformation is taking place, you have large volumes of fish, that are coming into the market, we find a large chunk of this fish actually being diverted to export markets, which means there's little available for domestic markets and the prices for fish in domestic markets has actually gone up substantially. Um, what it did was that it already put some pressure on Kohli women uh, and Kohli women were operating within a very restricted market and they found that in this restricted market, their main grouse was that now migrant men are coming in and buying extremely low-end fish, for instance, that perhaps they would not buy on their own. Uh, and they were choosing to vend this outside of market spaces, right? So there was again a disruption in what was understood as the traditional way in which the livelihood was fed via the commons. Uh, and again, this was a disruption that was, um, that in some ways was understood via the entry of migrants, right? Now, the reason I'm saying this question of migrants repeatedly is because this has become the critical sort of issue on the ground in the fisheries in Mumbai today, right? The, uh, if we were to sort of zoom out of this picture for a second, the broader context uh, of what we're looking at now is that a capitalist transformation has taken place which has led to uh, eco severe ecological degradation, right? Uh, we've actually had recorded periods of fish famines where they have just overfished areas to an extent that there is no longer any kind of fish available. We're also talking about um, a strong sort of class question that has emerged within the fisheries. Even though, as I mentioned earlier, you had cooperatives that were understood as being at the head or, you know, or a cooperative was necessary in order to access capital intensive technology. Uh, very often this was flouted and what we had was, uh, you know, what, what they call fake cooperative. So you had six sort of members who were just uh, sleeping partners and you had one active member who was basically bringing in the capital that was necessary and typically uh, within a year or two after having acquired the state funds and subsidies, the other six partners were sort of let go of and the one partner remained behind. So you had the creation of a new capitalist class within the Kohli's. You also had, because there was such a heavy push from the Indian state in 1991, they opened up exclusive economic zones in the deep seas, inviting uh, foreign uh, sort of capital to come in and participate in deep sea fishing. So they were, they were really pushing this agenda of a capitalist transformation. And so you had also uh, a whole range of capitalists from other communities entering, right? So at multiple levels within the fisheries, you had what was a traditional occupation now opened up to allow for other community members to enter them, either at the level of capitalists or at the level of labor, right? Uh, and it is, and this was also, as I said, taking place in the context of this ecological degradation. So what we had uh, beginning from the uh, 90s onwards till uh, at least 2015, uh, was that a National Fish Workers Forum, which has been an active uh, movement aligning various fisher organizations uh, along the coast, has been pushing this kind of question of saying we need to rethink the kind of way in which we understand the commons, right? And the way for them to do that was to try and make the argument, uh, very interestingly, in the period prior to 1989, they made this argument by saying we need to restrict the entry of big capital in fishing. Right? Because the problem was that this capital intensive technology they felt was inducing a disruption in social relations of production, was inducing uh, disruptions in traditional livelihoods and this was sort of exacerbating social tensions in some kind of way. But post 1989, the National Fish Workers Forum uses a discourse of an ecological problem to say we need to curtail big capital because ecological questions are threatened. Right? Now, the solution to this for the National Fish Workers Forum was to say, let us have a demand to say that only traditional fishing communities ought to have rights over these common spaces, right? So, the imagination here was that because traditional fishing communities have sustainable 
production practices themselves it is better for them to be at the helm of these kind of practices and livelihood concerns as opposed to allowing other community people to come in and um, and run this because they were entering again as i mentioned typically in the form of capitalists right but within the city of bombay this demand of exclusive access for traditional communities gets interpreted in a very different manner so as i mentioned uh, we see migrant labor entering uh, the work on boats we see migrant labor entering the work uh, in markets right traditional work done by coolie women right and all of this again 80s uh, actually starting from the 70s onwards is happening also in the context where bombay as a highly urbanized site is anyway drawing very large stream of migrants right late 60s is also the time when the shiv sena begins to emerge in mumbai right and the shiv sena uh, is a very interesting uh, political formation because it i mean now we have the aap but at that point of time it was one of the only parties that had an exclusive sort of city based urban based agenda uh, and that agenda was a politically regressive agenda where they were basically making the argument that jobs were not going to locals or natives right so the whole sons of the soil movement that was sort of whipped up by the sena um began at this point of time at that point in the late 60s and 70s the the migrant who was seen as problematic was very different right so in the late 60s when the shiv sena begins the problem is the south indian migrant who is uh, you know, sort of usurping the jobs of middle class white collar workers mahara you know el- well educated a middle to upper caste maharashtrians who are being denied work because of the incursion of south indian migrants right then uh, from the 80s onwards this sort of starts uh, diluting a bit so it's not so much the south indian migrant anymore uh, but that is when we start seeing the discourse of the north indian migrants starting to build and this sort of comes to a head in late 90s early 2000s uh, and you have several sort of splinter groups for instance from the shiv sena you have the splinter group of the maharashtra navnirman sena who picks up pretty much the same kind of agenda right so the nativist discourse the sons of the soil discourse is very entrenched in the politics of mumbai where the interpretation is there are finite resources there's finite amount of land um there are limited amount of jobs and all of this is actually going to migrants who are constantly streaming into the city because of the economic opportunities that are available right but what is critically happening is that while they are building this sons of the soil kind of discourse they are moving out of their concerns of the migrant in formal white collar work shifting this over a period of time to more informalized kind of work so that you have migrants who are coming in who are um, economically weaker typically coming in from lower uh, economic backgrounds uh, middle to lower order castes who are coming in who are increasingly becoming the targets of the violence of the sena right and the sena is very um, very quickly able to work this agenda around various kinds of interest groups in the city one of whom also become the koli community right now the kolis as i mentioned earlier also have a self perception also a widely recognized perception uh, it's not just a self perception of being the original inhabitants right and so that notion of being the original inhabitants is brought uh, brought together with this sort of nativist discourse and tied together to make the argument that look the kolis to whom bombay originally belongs are also being marginalized are also being sidelined within their own cities right so they are being denied access to land within their cities they are being denied access to even fishing what was once theirs is no longer theirs because migrants are coming in and taking over their jobs right and very interestingly what starts happening is that it is not so much the kohli men who actually begin to participate uh, actively in this discourse and participate with the shiv sena but rather it is kohli women right who act, begin to join the sena in large numbers um you know are not just part of their local cadre but also get important sort of roles in uh, various shakhas as even the sena has them uh, and start uh, becoming so strident about this position around the migrant and again it in you know in a uh, overlap it is not just any migrant it is the north indian migrant that come 2004 we actually have a moment 
uh, in Mumbai where Kohli women violently attack North Indian migrant men from participating in work in the fishing, in fishing, right? Um, the violence is something that is disputable. In my, the interviews I conducted, um, many women did tell me that there was violence. They have several cases booked against them. Um, but this is something that is generally looked uh, to be sort of not discussed as much because it, it speaks to a past where uh, which has gotten them into a lot of trouble, right? So 2004, this major attack happens on uh, North Indian migrants. And from then on, we can see that there is a strong coalescing around this position to say that not just fishing, right, but the lands in the city, the right to, to a livelihood in the city, and there, by extension, a right to the city itself is something that should remain exclusive to traditional communities. For instance, the Kohli's who happen to be the original inhabitants, right? Um, and uh, as this movement uh, develops, right, even as there is a distancing, a shift taking place from the Sena itself, we find that while these women and while these local fishing cooperatives are participating with a larger national fish workers forum, which has uh, nothing to do with this kind of politics of nativism on the ground, the ways in which national level demands come to be articulated and understood at the local level have much to do with these contestations that are and local dynamics that are taking place within the city itself right so the national fish workers forums original demand to say exclusive access for fishing to traditional fishing communities comes on some ground of protecting livelihoods as well as protecting um, the ecology right with the idea that prevent the access of big capital, pre limit the access of capital intensive technology to build what they call small scale fishing and promote small scale fishing, right? But this very same demand on the ground in Mumbai gets understood as a way to fortify their claim to say Mumbai only belongs to Mumbaikers, right? And furthermore, Mumbai only belongs to the Kohli's who are the original of all Mumbaikers and therefore migrant labor must be continuously stopped. Um, just to sort of address this question of why is it that women were at the forefront of this and not so much the Kohli men, um, one of the um, arguments that I make in my research is to suggest that there have been commons, as I mentioned again, always have differential terms of access, right? And uh, the, as I mentioned, because of the sex-based division of labor, women are restricted to the work in fish vending, right? Men are participating in the actual work of fishing. Now, this actual work of fishing has undergone a world of a change, as I mentioned, through this technology that has been introduced. It's introduced a class of capitalists who have um, every interest in making sure that, uh, you know, even as they would prefer that Kohli's only do it, they would want that large capital is not restricted within the fisheries because that would automatically mean uh, an impact on them, right? Uh, but for women, right? While this world of modernization and capitalist transformation is imagined, no kind of technological intervention comes on their work, right? So their work, you know, sort of remains pretty much exactly the same as, uh, you know, as they've been practicing from the last, say, easily like a hundred years. Like very, very few changes in technology have come in. And if they have come in, there has been no real initiative by the state to actually introduce a ease access to this technology for these women. So women are operating on older modes of production and within that they find that the, the rules of the system or the rules of the game for instance are changing in such a way that they are disprivileged at it and in looking for a, for a cause for this it becomes very easy to target the migrant as you know being the face of this disruption and the face of the change um, as opposed to sort of initially saying that perhaps the entire transformation was to blame, right? Uh, part of this is also that, of course, they come from families which may have also made some gains from the capitalist transformation that actually came in. The other factor is that within the city of Mumbai, access to public education has registered quite a change over the last few decades. Now, as I mentioned, the Kohli's are a backward caste. Uh, so education levels were always 
extremely low for this community and this is a very um, sort of important cause for concern for community members again from uh, the late 19th early 20th century onwards right but the gains in education have really come in the late 20th and early 21st century and um, I did a survey as part of my study where I did a generational sort of mapping of education where uh, it's very quick to realize that you know one is quick to realize that the transformation in education and the gains in education have primarily gone to men within the community. Having gained access to this kind of education within Kohli men, if you were to speak to them, there is very little aspiration to actually participate in fishing themselves, right? Fishing is still seen as manual labor. It is not necessary, even as it has come to be mechanized and transformed uh, over the years, it is still seen as some kind of informalized work, which is not as respectful which is not as uh, you know it doesn't provide you a path to social mobility like say white collar work in an office does right so the aspiration of occupation for Kohli men has been very uh, sort of rapidly changing from the last few decades onwards where gains that have been economic gains uh, social gains that have been made are being looked to translate into work outside of the fisheries right these gains, educational gains, however, while they have come for women, have not come at the same rate as it has come for men, right? And even now in the current generation, one can notice this sort of gap and discrepancy in education. So it's no longer the case that girls will be denied in education. They'll all go to school. Uh, but the difference comes in that boys will go to English medium schools, whereas the girls will go to Marathi medium schools. The boys might go to private schools where parents are saving a lot of money, investing a lot of money in education, whereas girls might go to the, um, not necessarily public, even girls might go to private schools, but a slightly lower rung of private schools or public schools that they might go to. So women uh, do not have the resources that the Kohli women do not have the resources they need to actually take a step outside of the fisheries, even if that is the aspiration. And one notices that is happening for those who are highly educated. So the moment they get, uh, you know, secondary education, college degree, for instance, they typically move outside of the fisheries into what they conceive as more formal forms of work, right, which are more uh, respectable, quote unquote, right. Um, but because a larger chunk of them remain back within the fisheries, right, they seem to have a stronger interest in making sure that at least given that they are within the fisheries, they can actually retain a strong hold over it as opposed to what they perceive as losing ground to new entrants who have come in, which are the migrants, right? Of course, again, as I mentioned, these migrants are migrants from within the state, migrants not just from North India, but South India, East India, other parts of West India, for instance. But because it's, you know, whipped up in the nativist discourse of the city itself, it is specifically the North Indian migrant who has come to be the target of this, right? Um, so just to sort of wrap this up, I think the, the point, uh, what, what should we understand from this, right? That contestations around commons ought to be situated in a larger political economy, right? This is something that, um, you know, we, we need to constantly reiterate and say because even as we have had writing on this from, you know, again, the 50s, 60s onwards, it is a point that we tend to somehow gloss over and, go, you know, mistake quite commonly. So, for instance, when we are thinking about policy formulations on this kind of question, if we are to hark back to ideas that the community itself knows best or the community is always guided by an interest of protection of the commons, that is not necessarily the case, right? For instance, in the case of the Kohli's in Mumbai, we'll realize very quickly that Kohli men are quite happy to participate in a capital intensive economy that actually completely degrades and destroys the seas as commons, right? Uh, to the point of, you know, actually brink of destruction. Uh, but Kohli women don't do so. So if we were to work with the idea of the homogenous community, we wouldn't be able to really notice these kind of differences. So one is to think of it in terms of saying, situate the context, right? What is the context in which contestations around resources and livelihoods are taking place? Who are the major participants here, right? What are the kinds of interests that are driving various kinds of groups actually requires very, very close attention. And unless we pay that close attention, we won't be able to formulate policy uh, effectively. The other is also to try and say that 
all commons cannot be treated in the same way, right? So the seas as commons or coastal, uh, you know, the seas in particular as commons are very, very different and they sort of escape our ability to think of them in the same ways as which we conceive of land as a common, right? So typically when we're thinking about, again, policy concerns around commons, we want to think of some kind of idea of um, community ownership, some kind of idea of boundedness, territoriality, all of this is very fuzzy and hard to establish when we're talking about something like the seas, right? Uh, even as we do have policy formulations to look at this. So in the seas, you, you don't have necessarily notions of ownership, but you will have some notion of territoriality that is established, right? So you might have policies that say, uh, and this is what the Indian, various sort of states did, Kerala did, Tamil Nadu did, Maharashtra did. At various points of time, they had regulation to say, from the shoreline till five fathoms in the sea, you will only have traditional fisher people fish, right? From five to the 12 mile zone, you will have a mix of different kinds of people fishing. In the deep sea, it is fair game, open to all. Those who want to go, those who don't. It's another matter that this is all violated. And it's violated because of the logic of capital accumulation that determines how um, you know, production ought to be organized now within the fisheries, right? But it is important to keep in mind that it is, it is going to be extremely hard to try and think of parallels in the seas as common with other kinds of commons. And this again has been a major kind of concern for national fish workers, movements that have taken place. So one of the big NFF demands was again to say that, look, we need a dedicated ministry within the central government that is devoted to the fisheries. Right? Because otherwise what happens is fisheries is clubbed under animal husbandry. And the biggest problem that they, you know, if you talk to fish people in no matter which state, uh, they will always tell you that, you know, that wo minister comes from somewhere else, unko pata bhi nahi hai ki what the sea looks like. So they are translating agrarian, agricultural policies into the seas, right? And there is no consonance, you know, there's no sort of congruence between them whatsoever. And so those policies make little to no sense. So every time they need a policy for themselves, it's a much longer, harder process for them to be able to negotiate those, right? The reason I'm mentioning all of this is because it is precisely this kind of uphill battle over trying to negotiate and understand how common resources are managed and they're integral sort of linked to the urban space of the city that is feeding this kind of discourse of discontent, or uh, you know that they have been marginalized within their own spaces and that it feeds this idea of sort of lashing out and in this lashing out what is happening is one group of the dispossessed are actually lashing out against another right so we are not seeing a concerted movement for instance on the ground at least we're not seeing a concerted movement to say look at what this kind of trans capitalist transformation to the fisheries has done instead it has forced in a regressive kind of politics uh, where lines of religion, where lines of um, re ethnicity, region, for instance, have become such sharp barriers that they're actually provoking incidents of violence, right? So what we need, therefore, is, um, is a closer ear to the ground. And if we have a closer ear to the ground, we'll be able to respond to the concerns that are emerging from these communities. And that can only happen if we actually pay closer attention to the nuances, to the details uh, of how livelihoods are interconnected of how livelihoods are actually not just determined by one resource itself but how it, that resource itself is situated within a larger context right so that that becomes the foundation for actually building a better kind of politics and building uh, from the state's end at least building better kinds of policies that can actually respond to the interests of communities much more and in that kind of way, we can also achieve this idea of the right to the city. I'm going, I interpret, I mean, you know, if you read Harvey, for instance, the idea of democratizing questions of determining urban politics, urban governance. This is what we need much more than ever, right? But that democratizing question itself has to be translated into more progressive grounds. If we were to just leave it to how, for instance, the larger community, traditional communities interpret it at this point of time, it may not translate on its own into the most progressive kind of politics. So it requires some kind of rethinking about how we approach questions of right to the city. Not enough to say Kohli's are marginalized, give them the right to the city because that right is being demanded at the cost of pushing the migrant out, right? So we need to think about these questions a little more and the only way to do it is with this 
closer here to the ground. Yes. Okay. With that, I'll just thank you.